Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry to stop. sorry to cut your conversation short, but we have a um, issue of the friends. We talked about it when we decided this. So since so many of you are friends of, Pine, of the Pioneer Memorial Library, um, but the friends would present their annual report to you. So um, Jan Barnum, the president, is going to come up, and um, Carla is going to come up, right. and Pat Erickson is going to sit in the back. Um, Joe Hartman is not here, he's in the hospital. Wendy Weiser is working, and uh, Kelly Myers, of course, is working, and um, yeah. So these uh, are the ones that we have here. Very nice. Nice. Oh, well, she's actually, she's not quite a board member until today, but she gets voted in. Helping us. She, came on, she came on to help us with the murder mystery and everything early. So she's, you've already voted on her. <laughs> okay, so here's Jan. Okay, I'm going to try and make this quick because you don't want to hear me talk. Uh, we've got the agenda up there, but we'll be showing other things throughout the meeting. And we're going to start with the minutes. Is that why you're here? Hey, Okay. Our 2022 annual meeting minutes um, were April 9th, 2022 last year. The annual meeting of the Friends of Pioneer Memorial Library was held on Saturday, April 9th at 6 p.m. in person at the Pioneer Memorial Library conference room upstairs, right before the 2022 murder mystery. Melanie Wilkes, Library Director, Wendy Weisar, Acting President, Carla Hager, Acting Secretary, and Director. Uh, Linda Nelson, Mark Weisler, and Joe Krauss were present. Uh, Wendy called the supporter. Carla read the minutes from the February 25th, 2021 meeting. Wendy had a correction to the minutes on number six on the second day, but not number 11 on activities and funding report. Linda Nelson moved to accept the minutes as corrected, and Joe Krauss seconded. Motion carried. Carla Hager went through the financial report for 2021. The 2021 trip ended with a balance of $15,588.98. Mark Weisar moved to the report as read and the Lenny Wilkes seconded motion carry. There were 139 properties mailed out, 3% of the agency, 30% by law requirements. Out of 65 properties returned, one property was returned with no signature, therefore was not counted. The other 54 properties counted to be elected. Dan Barnum to the Friends Board. Number five, all present read through the 2021 activities and funding annual report. And it was discussed that the following needs to be added to number 11 regarding the tax sale on all that funds for this did not go through the Friends checking account, but with the Friends fundraising project. Number six, business items. Wendy reminded everyone of the Friends meeting are always held the second Tuesday of the month at 7 a.m. and any members welcome to. Ten. There was no other business discussed. No press news, and Linda Nelson seconded to adjourn the meeting. Motion mm -hmm. carried. And since I was down here with the murder mystery, I think they look just great. Do uh, we have any questions or comments about the minutes of what we did the year before last? If now I would entertain a motion to accept the minutes as read. Pat Erickson's going to. Move that. Do I have a second from anyone? Joe Krauss will second that. Any other discussion? And all in favor, please say aye, raise your hand. Any opposed, say sign. Motion carries. Um, and since she's standing here looking so good in her outfit, um, I'll let her do the financials since she is the official our treasurer. All right, the financial statement for 2022 up on the board. Um, for memberships for uh, income, we had 3435 for the year. Adopt Magazine was $350. Note card sales, $20. Green Reef sales, $4,518.14. The murder degree 2022 sponsorship from CNCI was $2,000. Amazon Smile electronic credits, $5. Murder Mystery Fundraiser, $2,185. Greater <laughs> City Community Foundation from Billions Piper Memorial Donation was $500. Uh, 
Cookbook sales were five dollars and selling terrible groceries hundred, giving a total of thirteen thousand one hundred eight dollars and fourteen cents for income for twenty twenty two. And then the expenses or postage for two hundred sixty seven fifty one National Library expense for the presenter was six hundred and fifty. Booked for lunch expense for an author was five hundred. Downtown for the three Halloween was two hundred and sixty one forty five. Summer reading for the children and adults um, was three thousand six hundred and fifty. Annual report filing fee was forty. Or liquor for the old library cards and heavy glasses um, for retirement was. $9.30. Murder mystery expenses was $1,486.23. Thomas County Chamber gift cards $80. Sherwood Ford Farms Greenery was $3,560.05. And staff Christmas gift cards were $325. Getting an expense for approval expenses for to $11,989.54. So the balance ending as of December 31st, 2022 is $16,433.07. Thank you, Carla. And I would add that we have a $500 designated fund for your scavenger hunt that we hope to get going uh, once our volunteer scavenger hunt organizer funds come to do that. So uh, otherwise, that's all money that we and spend on the library, which you know that we have done quite a bit of. Um, Carla does a great job every month to make sure we know exactly how much we have and uh, how much we can spend and keep us on our financial toes. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion for the financial report to be approved? I move to approve. Diane Gershner will approve. Our motion move. Do I have a second? Second. I'm sorry. Wayne Morlicker will feel like a talk here. <laughs> um, and uh, do I have any discussion? Any questions about our financial? Our big fundraiser that uh, raises a couple thousand dollars will be this Saturday. Um, I hope to see you all there. Or what you understand is a lady who doesn't have any tickets already. Yeah, I have one comment. The adult magazine. Because we didn't send it out of it's all very often. We were supposed to remember to drive, we were in the middle of it, but we still need to fight it every month somehow. So that's why that's the small point. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so no more discussion. All in favor of accepting this report as presented, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. All opposed, say sign. Okay, and thank you. And you know, all that money that she ran that we get as an income, all of that comes from people like you. So we really appreciate you as well. Okay, the uh, vote for new members, Mary Lou Jones uh, has graciously offered to be on the board, as has Tim Watts. He's not able to be here today, but. Um, the proxies, it says that 115 proxies were mailed out, and 33% uh, were met by the, by the bylaws to be counted. 65 were returned. Three of them were, were with no signature and were not counted, so 62 were counted. Uh, 62 votes for Mary Lou and 55 for Kim to be on the board. Seven didn't have any selection. That's probably fair if you don't know somebody, you probably don't want to say yay or nay. Uh, Carla was up for re-election this year, and she got the 62 votes as well. Um, they all pretty much got the, the unanimous vote on the three uh, uncounted proxies, but I don't know that they would have been the deal breaker. Uh, welcome to the board. <laughs> this is for people who like to get up at 7. And if you are one of those, please. Uh, the activities that we had, she touched on a lot of them because they were in the financial report. Uh, the Adopt a Magazine usually goes out in November, October, November, but this year because of a whole host of reasons, we sent it out with the uh, principal library. So, like she said, that's why it's not 
as um, looking as profitable right now. Uh, but 50 magazines and two newspaper subscriptions were sponsored at a cost of 1957 and 78 cents in 2022. Uh, this year we received 350, um, and that'll grow because we've got some really generous people there. Uh, the adult and teen summer reading program, we gave $150 for prizes. And the children's program, we sponsored for $3,500. And we served 2,291 children during reading time, story time, and the lap sit throughout the whole year. The membership for 2022, 98 single and family memberships and 17 business memberships were sent in with an income of $3,435. The murder mystery uh, was held on April 9th, and the title of the murder was uh, Death is a chef, cabaret old chum. Uh, ticket sales were $21.85. Um, Family Center for Healthcare sponsored the murder mystery for $2,000. And so after the costs were taken out, we earned $26.18.77. Uh, book for lunch, where you're all here. And National Library Week, uh, $500 was given to help support the programs for authors and speakers at Book for Lunch. Um, 650 was given to help support authors and presenters during National Library Week as well. And I uh, believe we've done the same thing this year, so I don't know if you uh, The note cards, we all sell the note cards with the envelopes for $5. Uh, there was four sets sold last year. Uh, we also place them in welcome buckets for new residents to the Colby Thomas County. And if you don't know what the note cards are, those are the note cards of when we used to do the um, A Day in the Life of Thomas County. And so there are just pictures of different scenes in Thomas County. Um, the cookbooks were printed in the mid 1990s. We still have some and we still offer them. And last year we sold. Um, they still have great recipes. We sell a lot. Um, we, we again, we sold the Christmas greenery. Um, orders for, tw for 22 and 28 inches wreaths, garlands, swags, and centerpieces. Uh, we sell them during October and go through Sherwood Forest Farms in Washington State. Smell fantastic. Uh, gift orders for direct delivery to people are also available, so you can order it and they ship it straight to your person. Uh, works great. I give it to my stepmother in Nebraska. Don't have to worry about it. Um, the greenery arrived the week after Thanksgiving, and total sales were 4518 and 14 cents. And after the greenery, we made a profit of, profits of $958.09. Um, Bill and Nancy Piper's family gives a gift of $500. And the uh, Amazon Smile gives sign up through Amazon Smile. They will give a percentage of your purchase back to us if you designate us. We made five dollars that, and the Fidelity charitable donation of hundred dollars was also given. So those are most of our activities. Um, do you have any questions into what friends do, or maybe an activity you'd like to see done, or if you'd like to help with something? Either uh, take a question now, or you can always talk to Melanie or Ben. If not, I would entertain. Again, we'd like to invite you to come to any meeting. We have one left in May, I believe it's the 10th. I don't know. It's the second Tuesday, whatever that is. And then we can take a summer sabbatical until so. <laughs> um, go ahead. I think the brochure is your hiring. It's only a 15 hour. It's only fifteen dollars and it gets you um, all the privileges of being able to say, I'm a friend of my group. If there's no other questions, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I have a problem. Uh, Joe's, uh, Joe Crafts, five seconds.
I'm surprised you're not all just like that. It's kind of like you're way older than the second half. And all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Enjoy the rest of your day. All righty, without further ado, we're going to invite Kara Schreyer up. Um, Kara Schreyer, if you don't know her, is from the is a librarian at the uh, Colby Community College, and she is one of our favorite speakers. Um, and so we always invite her during National Library Week, and today she is telling us the story of Georgia Tan. So come on in. <laughs> Yeah, I think you can put your mic. Well, that's because like you're going to be loud and I don't want to be in space. No, no, I'm good. I'm so good. How is everybody? First, thanks for asking me to come speak. So, before I get started, I want to tell you when I started out with this subject, um, I had this grand plan and I put this together and then. Last week, when I was going through and timing it, I went, holy cow, these people have a life. I have to pair this in. <laughs> so, um, I want to tell you, I got tuned in to the, the story of this whole scandal last summer. So, for those of you that don't know, when I started being a library director in May, it came out way how it was, Dr. Rodman, and I'm a loss for a family business. And I wanted something to listen to while I was mowing. I was Olivia, and I was scrolling through, and I said, oh, before we were yours. Well, this is like a really interesting story. So I downloaded it, and I listened um, to the book while I was mowing. Um, so it's it's a story. Um, it's, a, it's a historical fiction, but it's based on real events. It's based on things that really happen. Um, but the story, okay, we need to the time shift um, going back from present day. And one of the main characters, Avery Stafford, um, her family is very well to do in South Carolina. Her father's a state senator. She's been brought home um, from corporate law up north to um, help be groomed for the potential position of being, taking her father's place in the Senate. But um, she met a nursing home. Um, in the start of the book, and she's there supporting her father with his nursing home initiative. One of the nursing home residents named May is very taken with her because of a bracelet that she's wearing, which is a bracelet of three fireflies that her grandmother is giving her. May calls her by this name because he doesn't know. She doesn't think anything about it until the nursing home calls and says, hey, we found your bracelet. One of our residents had it. She goes back in to get her bracelet and the woman starts talking to her. Um, but the thing she's most taken with is the picture that sits on her nightstand of a couple and the woman is a dead ringer for her grandmother. There's a strong Stafford family trait of blonde corkscrew curls and dominating blue eyes. And the story kicks off from there and then in time shifts back into the 1930s, 1939, with the story of Real Foss and her siblings. Um, they're shantyboat people, but they live on a riverboat. They're right outside, they're on Mud Island, um, right outside of Memphis. 
mother is pregnant and having a difficult time with the birth of twins, so they take her into Memphis. Rill is left in charge. A couple days later, the authorities raid the shanty boat and take the kids. They lie to them to get them off the boat. And then the story goes on and unfolds um, about the story goes on and unfolds about what happens to Rill and her siblings. But as time shifts back and forth, and as you go through the story, who Meg Crandall actually is, how she falls into relation with neighbor Stafford's grandmother, and the correlation between that and Rill Foss and her siblings. Um, they're taken to um, the Tennessee Children's Home Society, which is ran by a woman named Georgia Tan in the book. So I read the story and I got done with it and I went, oh my gosh, what a great story. And now I'm gonna confess a sin. When I read a tangible book, I don't always read the author's but because in the book, there's any of you that are authors and you write books in your books, it's terribly slow. Um, because I was listening to it and I was on a mower at this time. And so I wasn't in a position on the mower where I could like stop. And so I was listening to the author's book and I went, holy cow, this is actually, this, this person was real. These events really happened. And so that. Um, it's fiction, but it was based on truth. And so that actually turned me on to the story of the baby. Um, it's the story of Georgia Tan and how she sold babies through legal practices um, for 25 years. Yeah, 25 years. Um, so Barbara started, Barbara Raymond started writing the story because. One of the children, one of her and her husband's two children may have died. And it kind of starts, she's talking about um, her daughters looking for her, her lineage, trying to find information about her birth parents, trying to find information and the hardships and things like that. She read an article in Good Housekeeping magazine um, alluding to the story of Georgia Tan and the uh, issues that the children had trying to get their information applied. And so reading this article led her to do some research, um, which led to the right. Now the child she adopted was not a tan baby, which is what the babies were called as we get into this story. Um, but she, she took this and she wrote this in segments. Um, she started with Georgia's youth, um, Georgia's Memphis, Georgia's crimes, and Georgia's secrets. Um, and I read it and went, oh my goodness, and then like I went to like it again, and I went, okay, it's But she laid, and I really struggled with this because I want to tell you a story. I don't want to lecture, but some of this I feel was so important for you to understand how Memphis came to be and how the citizens came to be that she was allowed to do what she did for so long. So the foundation of this starts actually with what Memphis was in the, mid, the beginning of the 1800s up to about the mid-1870s of what happened for Memphis to be what it was after. When Memphis was first founded, it was very gentrified. It had, um, you had gentlemen farmers, you had plantations, you had merchants. They were striving to make Memphis um, the most desired place to live in the United States. They were largely unscathed from the Civil War. They had one skirmish on the Mississippi River. But they, they were very gentrified. They had merchants, they had commerce. They were at one point the largest inland cotton importer in the nation because of the Mississippi River. And then the one downfall that they had was their sanitation system. It was horrible. Their um, sewer lines ran right into the bayou, which went right into the stagnant water pools. Um, they were not good with their sanitation. As we all know, living in Western Kansas, whenever uh, we get rain and we have standing water, standing water becomes a breeding ground for mosquitoes. And so what ended up happening was the river boats coming up the Mississippi River brought mosquitoes and brought yellow fever. <laughs> So the mosquitoes came in, they laid their eggs in the pools. Um, people working the riverboats coming off offshore and going into Memphis, they spread yellow fever. It hit Memphis really, really hard in the 1870s. 
They had their first freeze thaw cycle. They felt that they were over it because a freeze kills the bugs, but it doesn't kill kids. And they battled this for a long time. They lost um, due to death and due to the citizens not wanting to contract this horrible disease, which there was no cure for in the 1870s and 80s. They, they left. They fled the city. Um, and so when they finally got it under control around the turn of the century, then the citizens that repopulated them then were vastly different. So among those who abandoned the city were the Germans who had brought to Memphis music, theater, and industry. Almost all of the Irish died in the flood. The proportion of foreign born citizens, which had been 30% in 1860, dropped to 5% in 1900. The population began to rebuild, but its composition was different from before. For the replacements for the lost Indians were poor, often illiterate newcomers from the most rural areas of Arkansas, Mississippi, and Tennessee. They couldn't afford to pay taxes, and civic leaders were forced to declare the city safe. So what they had before this and what they had after were vastly different, which set the stage for the things to come. So this man, um, and again, this is just, I, I have to build this foundation so you can understand how this woman could do this. Um, this man, Edward O. Boss Crown, he grew up very poor. He grew up impoverished. Um, in order to get the things that he had in life, he, he had to use some pretty unscrupulous means. But this was the man who took Memphis from the ruins after the yellow fever, and brought it back to um, brought it back to a place that Memphis could be proud to say that they lived in. But his 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 ways of doing it were were not always good. He was ruthless. He was a bully. Um, it's reputed the the the, book, the sources in the book say this man had an ego as wide as the Mississippi River. And I've actually been to Memphis, and the Mississippi River in that part of Memphis is pretty dang wild. So. <laughs> Um, but so he came through with the ways that he did things. Um, he was elected to the city commission in 1907, and then he was elected mayor in 1910. But I have a couple of, I have an example in here, just one example of what happened if you crossed this man um, after he came into power. So for the first time since the play, citizens traveling outside the city could identify themselves as Memphis without embarrassment. Those who cooperated with Crump found their lives so easy. When a young attorney named Gerald Stratton asked for his support in the 1930s, Crump smiled and said, I'll cast all you in a couple of times. <laughs> Instantly, Stratton became a state legislator. Two years later, he was state senator, and two years after that, he was elected to the Luke Post and County Clerk Court. Then, Gerald asserted himself. After increasing frustrating years of obstacles, he criticized Crump's support of poll tax. Stunned and furious, Crump demanded him resign from his office. He refused, and he was harassed by threatening phone calls and police surveillance. Most upsetting to him and his wife, however, was the shunning. No one spoke to Gerald at work or on the street. He was blackballed from the junior league, the local chapter of the Red Cross, who had let his wife go in blood. They were treated like weapons. Then one Sunday morning, a man in a black sedan tried, or pretended to try, in Memphis, it's hard to know the difference, to run them over. At 42 years of age, he suffered a heart attack. So they were shunned from the city. They ended up leaving, and they moved up north. That's a very calm example the book gives. The book talks about those that opposed this man, some of them finding themselves floating, floating face down in the Mississippi River. That's how he chose to deal with people who decided they wanted to stand up to him for the policies and the practices he was doing politically in Memphis. This man ruled Memphis for almost 40 years. You were either with him or you were against him. If you were against him, was it good? So then that enters this woman, George Pan. Her story, she was born in Pearl, Mississippi. Um, she came from a really well-to-do family, which is important because they were snobs. Um, her, her family lineage was something that was something to be desired. Her dad was a second chancery district court judge. 
But it was really hard for the author to find information about her because no one in that part of the world wanted to um, face the, the stigma or the shame of having this woman that this story broke years later about the things she had done. They were embarrassed at her having been a citizen of their community. Um, it was interesting that her, her older brother may or may not have been adopted. Um, it's, that kind of plays into her feelings about adoption. She was a lot like her dad. Um, the information that Barbara Raymond was able to get states that she was fearless. She was a born leader. Um, they even called her brilliant. She was very dominating, and that came through in everything that she did. What she said when she ran um, the Tennessee Children's Home Society, when she oversaw the boarding houses, when she um, made decisions she made, what she said went. You didn't cross her. Um, but there was a couple things that were didn't go well in her favor. One of them was her sexual orientation. She did not want to be a typical Southern woman, the wife of Southern gentility. Um, I'm not sure at the turn of the century if the term lesbian was one that was used in society, um, but this was a humongous issue with her parents. Her and her dad were in issues a lot because of that. Um, the other thing was she wanted to practice law. So she had two strikes against her there in rural Mississippi, um, who she chose to, to love and what she chose to do. Her father forbade her to practice law. She did go to school and she got a music degree. She didn't use it. She found her nation social. Um, the book talks about the first adoption she actually arranged, which was actually in 1906 when she was really young. Her father had two abandoned children in his corporate and didn't know what to do with them. She kind of made it her mission and within about three weeks had found a wealthy couple in Mississippi to take these children and adopt, which sounds great, but I think that, in me reading the book, started the creating of the monster she became. In 1922, she was driving, according to the book, she was driving down the road, came across, um, well, one thing to tell you first, her family, they were snobs. Um, the worst thing in their opinion, which bled down and was manifested in her, the worst thing you could do or be was poor or impoverished. Um, they really looked down on poor people and their plight. And in 1922, she was driving around um, rural Mississippi where she was from and came across a little boy who was playing out on the front porch in his yard. He was unattended. She took him. She took him back. She used her father's influence a little bit to uh, declare the child abandoned. She went back and got the little boy Onyx, his older brother. The mother came and she sued to get her children back because the mother was inside sleeping at the time. Father sided with Georgia and declared the mother in the fix. She couldn't have her kids. This created a humongous stir in the community. Pretty much she was ran out of town. And she ended up going to Texas for a little bit. But then ultimately she ended up in Memphis, Tennessee. So another thing with this that, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow night at the library for the college students, but one of the things, um, again, kind of a foundation, the civilization history of abandoned children, of orphaned children, um, children who are given up. Historically, it's not good. Um, at the turn of the century, there were some orphanages, but some of them were good. Some, were, most of them were not, but there weren't a lot. Um, the book talks about at one point in time, children were put into state asylums, and many times they were put into state asylums um, with people who were considered criminally insane. So you have criminally insane adults and orphan children living in the same place. I can only imagine what those living conditions were actually like. Um, the book also talks about, and this is something um, Georgia knew, um, baby farms. There were baby farms. And, and the thing, you know, I think we all um, understand this, and that's not a stereotype or a knock on, on anyone or anything, but, you know, even when I was younger, um, the stigma of being an unwed mother 
was there. It's not as accepted as it wasn't as accepted in society as it, as it is today. That's a debate for another day. But in the early 1900s, that was a humongous to have a baby out of wedlock, to be an unwed uh, pregnant woman was you were a friend. And they had baby farms for that. And people would be paid a stipend to take the mothers and just take the babies. And to um, they were given a fee to house them, but there were no regulations on how well they were taken care of. Babies that were born that were sick on the baby farms were, in some cases, the book talks about they were drowned. They were left out in the elements. Um, one talked about babies being left out to freeze to death. The one that was even worse than that was the babies that were left outside in extreme heat, and they essentially burned to death because of dehydration. Um, Georgia Tan knew this, and she created boarding houses for these women, but there was a catch. She would house them, but then these women had to give up their babies. So that was just one of the ways that she did this. But, you know, how she did it. So after that scandal in Mississippi, um, her father's influence a little bit got into job in Memphis with the Tennessee Children's Home Society. Um, she, one thing here, she realized very quickly that there was a way that she could make adoption desirable. Only she did it wrong. Um, she worked for the parents, wealthy parents wanting children. Instead of her going to them and saying, well, I, we have these babies, she went out and found the babies to get to the parents. That's the way she did this. Um, she ignored laws. She ignored regulations. Um, the first thing she did when she moved to when she moved to Memphis was she gave Bob Trump support. She befriended him, and then she made sure everyone in Memphis knew he's my friend, he's my associate. You cross me, you cross him, it will end badly. And that's how she was able for 26 years um, to do the things that she did. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> So because of this, because of who Bob Trump was, she was able to get police officers, judges, social workers, nurses, physicians to look the other way at how she was obtaining babies. She was able to, to look the other way. How did she do it? She preyed on unwed mothers. Again, going back to what Memphis was made up of after yellow fever. She went after young unwed mothers. They were all white. She targeted a specific baby, which is how she had the physicians and the nurses. They would be on the workout. She would, um, she would look for a specific type of baby. That's what she would look for. She would have, well, I have one couple who is looking for a specific baby. And she would have the social workers and the nurses look for these babies. But she had these people under her thumb and the fact that she blackmailed them and she used extortion. So she kept her private and much of her personal life to herself, but she promoted her business. Faced with the challenge of inspiring wealthy and fertile couples to adopt children previously deemed unworthy, she procured the most beautiful babies she could find. She dressed them in elaborate layouts of organdy and lace. Then she placed one in her two in a simulation of twins in a ribbon bedecked with her basket and visited her targets. One of the targets she visited was a woman who was a social worker, and this author talked to her when she was 91. <laughs> At 91, when I spoke with Mildred, she described working in the 1930s for the Memphis Department of Public Welfare. And one day, Miss Tan just stopped in my office with this beautifully dressed, beautiful baby and said, Miss Stover, I have a child for you. So to keep this going to where, and well, hey, keep that in mind. Like I said, there's so much, but I don't want to rush. Um, she would have the nurses, she would have the social workers, she would have the doctors looking for this specific type of mother, a specific type of family. And then when the mothers were under the effects of anesthesia, because they didn't have medical birth in the hospitals, they would be under the effects of anesthesia. When they would come to, the doctors 
were taken to tell the women that their babies were stolen, and then they were shipped out. When the women were under the effects of anesthesia, the nurses would come in with a bunch of paperwork, and these women were mostly illiterate. They couldn't read. And they would be told, we just have some things we need you to sign out for the medical care for you and your baby. So they would sign them. But they were actually severing the rights of the baby they had just birthed and any of the children that they had. They would then take these papers, they would take them to the authorities, the authorities would go and they would the children from wherever they were. There's stories in here of the families um, on the riverboats and the children being taken away. But they would procure these documents and they would say, but you find them. Your babies are you, your babies are um, no longer yours. But she had to have help. And one of the people she had help with was this woman right here. This is Judge Camille Kelly. And she was the one who was the biggest helper of her in getting the amount of babies that she did. Um, hold on. Lost my Oh. oh, I lost my, I lost my sticker, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, <laughs> judges also approved your legal adoption. One judge approved 14 in a single day, but the judge most useful to Georgia was juvenile court judge Neil Pell. While pretending to advise parents struggling with illness, struggling with unemployment or divorce, Judge Kelly secretly severed their parental rights and she transferred custody of their children to Georgia. Kelly provided Georgia with a large number of children. 20% of the more than 5,000 children Georgia Tan adopted came from female health. So there's a reason I'm a librarian and not a mathematician. I think that's somewhere around 750. Am I close? Anybody? But this, this woman did this illegally. That's the kind of help that she had. Once she had the babies, then she would, um, she would change their names. She changed their birth names. She falsified adoption records. She illegally filed adoptions with babies that didn't have the names, especially the children she stole. She changed their name. She made them younger because she knew the younger the better. The wealthy parents that were looking um, for babies wanted them younger. She advertised them in her, excuse me, she advertised them in her, and I'm going to show you a slide of examples of the advertisements she put in the papers. She advertised them as blank slates just waiting to be filled. And she felt that when the, the people that actually were able to hire a lawyer to try to contest the severing of their rights as parents, um, she told them, you should be happy. Your children are going to people of a high type. They're going to be so much better off. I don't know what you're and she had the resources to back up what she was doing. Um, at one time, I wanted to show you, at one time, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt saw her out as one of the leading people um, on the benefits and one of the, the leading people that could speak to adoption. Once she got established in Tennessee, she took this national. And she, thanks to um, show you this one. Thanks to the newspaper advertisements, these she would put. These are examples of newspaper advertisements. These came from Tennessee. But once she started seeing, um, once she started seeing good results from this, she put advertisements like this in national city newspapers. So the previous slide before I show you, I don't know if you can all see. This is Joan Crawford. The two twins that she had here were Tan babies. Georgie Tan took the children, flew them to um, California. And these were these were her babies. She provided babies for like Joan Crawford, um, Dick Phillips, June Allison, Smiley Burnett, 
The governor of New York received a tan baby and they were all gotten illegally. The other thing that she would do is she would charge exorbitant fees for this. And this will be important here in a minute. Um, she would give these parents the opportunity to try out their babies. So they could have them for a little bit and then if it didn't work out, they could bring them back. How traumatizing is that, right? Um, but then once they, they had the baby, she would make up, she made up lineages. She changed their religion. Um, she made up fake stories about, oh, the mother is a college student and the father was a brilliant lawyer and they just couldn't afford to take care of a baby. Or um, this kid, the mother died in childbirth and the father is a musician and he just can't take care of this baby. But they come from brilliant, very smart, high, excuse me, high society people. And then she would charge outrageous fees for the adoption. Then she would go back and blackmail some of them and say, well, the birth parents now decided maybe they, they want to try to fight this and they bite their child back. I can make this go away, but it's going to cost you $1,500. So try to check to me. I'll take care of it. So th these are the things that, that she would do. So in addition to this, I, I talked to you a little bit about her sexual orientation. Um, the, the part of this book called George's Children, the stories in this segment are hard. Um, they're disturbing and they're heartbreaking and in some cases they're, they're sickening. Um, I'm going to read a couple of those stories to you. Um, the worst abuse occurred in a boarding home to which Georgia Tan sent Billy upon his arrival in Memphis. The home had 12 children and was owned by a thin woman with white hair. A handyman lived in the basement. He was big bones and wore overalls and smoked constantly. His name was Peterson. The other children warned Billy to stay away from Peterson and he hoped to. But when he was playing in the yard several days later, he fell into a puddle. And the white haired lady told him to stay on the porch until he dropped. Underneath the porch was an entrance leading to the basement, and Peterson came out and up to Billy. Come with me, he said. Billy tried to dodge his hand, but the man got it. He carried him to the basement. I'm not going to finish reading that story because it's pretty disturbing what happened to him, where all adults can think we can infer. Um, another story um, tied into one woman. The first story is about her sister, Mary. Mary was so underfed by some of the foster mothers George Tan placed her with that at age seven, she still fit into a high chair. One morning mother, angry that Mary had tasted the butter she was churning, made her sit in the high chair for two days without eating. Finally, the woman gave her a pail containing mashed potatoes, chicken, biscuits, and gravy and told her to feed it to the dog. Mary ate the food herself and was beaten. These are just a couple stories. There's another one in here that Barbara Davidson tells about abuse she had heard that occurred to her at the hands of George Tan. Um, the story is about her being tied to a bed with ropes and the things that George did to her as a small child. Um, the abuse is, is pretty heartbreaking with what happens to them under her care. So you would think that the story would just have this tremendous climax of, of how the whole thing came to be stopped. But in reality, it really didn't. Um, the, the problem she started to have with what she was doing started in the early 1940s. She had a heart attack in 1941 and another one in 1943. Then two things happened in 1945. Um, well, I want to backtrack one thing too. Some of the abuse that they talk about in here comes from the siblings of children who, when they were bad, were hung up by bed sheets or ropes in a closet with just their tiptoes, and they were hung there for days. Some of them died, and the bodies were never to this day, those bodies haven't been found. They weren't buried. They were just disposed of. Um, other things that happened if the children were being beaten to death, they were just disposed of. The people that ran her homes were not nice people. So, taking that, in 1945, two things happened. One, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Two, 
1945, in the winter 1945, in her, under her care, over 50 babies died. Yeah, 50 babies. With shot of the mortality rate for Memphis, infant mortality rate, it was the highest in the nation. And that, I think, is what really started people going, all right, enough, enough is enough. Um, started having some inquiries into what was going on. Physicians talk about in the story in the book here, and they talk about the physicians who going in to look at the baby, telling her, look, it's just an infection. Give them penicillin, the baby will be fine. And they refused. They wouldn't. If the child lived, they would. If they didn't, they were married. But the struggle with the camel back came with the defeat of Ross Crump. Ross Crump um, lost political power or began to lose political power in 1948 when outsiders were elected um, to legislature. Gordon Browning was elected governor, and Estes P. Prover was elected to the state Senate. That proved to be the beginning of the end because he started losing political power. So you started seeing people coming forward, complaints being filed um, in regard to um, in regard to what she was doing. They started passing, trying to pass legislation, but then again, at this point in time, she was trying to block it by going to her legislatures and people in charge and saying, I have this really beautiful baby. It's yours. All you have to do is oppose what's trying to come through Senate or the legislation. But by 1948 um, and into 1949, they decided to launch an investigation into the illegal practices of what she was doing. Um, but um, Gordon Browning wasn't a, a good man in the way that he went about it. He was no hero. He apparently meant to delay the announcement of George's crimes by the death. Remember, she had a very deep cancer. She took to her bed April 12, 1950, and she died September 15th of this or September 15th of the same year. He meant to delay the announcements of George's crimes until after her death. And she he dealt with her in response to the complaints, not of suffering of the adoptees of her parents, but of money, of the profits that she made. So he had no regard for the people he was elected to serve regarding their pain and suffering, regarding the fact that their children were stolen, that their rights were legally settled, um, that they were lied to, telling, being told that their babies had died when really they were just taken off and adopted out of state. Instead, he focused on the fact that she illegally, through illegal adoptions, made over a million dollars. Translating that money into what it's worth today, that would be $16 million that she made off of a legal adoption. So he didn't do his constituents, I don't think, um, any favors. There's some speculation as to if she had help dying because she knew the crime, she knew her crimes were going to be exposed. She died without ever having um, to face it. This is a monument that's in the cemetery in Memphis, Tennessee, dedicated to the Children's Fund Society, Society's history. Um, there are 19 known children who have their resting place here. There are hundreds of, of people that they don't know where they are. They were never found. Georgia Tan was a liar. She was a bully. She was a manipulator. And she was a pedophile. She stole children for her own financial means. She physically, emotionally, and sexually abused them for her own sick pleasure. And she died before she could be forced to face retribution for her sins and her crimes. A retired lawyer, when Barbara Raymond was writing this book, came to her and said, look, this was horrible, but why are you wanting to tell this story? What's the point? What are you going to get and the thing that I think that comes out of this after reading this book is validation and vindication for the babies that were stolen and the families who were torn apart. So the last part of this is um, the book Before and After. And I feel kind of like it's like the trilogy of the book. Um, this is the stories 
of the orphans who survived the Tennessee Children's Home Society scandal. And how this came to be written, uh, Judy Christie and Lisa Wingate wrote this. She was on a book tour for her book before and after, which she wrote, which was published in 2017. And at an event, probably I imagine something like this, an audience member stood up and said, I was one of the things. And so what that did was start her gathering information and gathering stories of people who were from the Tennessee Children's Home, who babies that were taken. Um, and it talks about how they encountered red tape. It was so hard for them to find information because their names were changed, their birth dates were changed, their parents' names were changed. And the state of Tennessee had closed adoption laws until the 1990s. Um, some of these stories have really great endings. Some of these stories have really, really horrible endings. Some of them are really happy and some of them are really, really sad. Um, but they all tell a good story. That's all I have for today. Thanks for listening to me. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Well, thanks for your time and attention. Thank you. I'm sure I've got many. Oh, I can always use sticky notes. As you can see from my book, I can use a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs>